It's like weirdly quiet. Is anybody else noticing that? It just seems odd. Oh, you just said that? What's that? Well, good morning, Nathan. You never say it, but I'll say it. Good. I'm here this morning, yes. I was in the back talking, like most people. Uh, but we're going to be in Matthew 5, so go ahead and open up to that. We're going to start in 10. The text for today is 10 through 20. We're going to bounce around, obviously, quite a bit between that, because as we talked about, I want to make sure that we don't just see the Sermon on the Mount in pieces. I feel like that's always one of the big issues with it, is we just kind of look at these little pieces and say, okay, here's the Beatitudes, case closed, move on to the next one. I don't want us to do that. I want us to look at the continuation of this as it continues through the sermon. And so that's what we're going to be talking about this morning, starting around verse 10 or 12. Um, before we do that, I'm going to ask Tommy to lead us in a word of prayer. Man, thank you. Last week we talked about, as I mentioned, then probably arguably the most famous section of the Sermon on the Mount, depending on what kind of mood you're in, who you talk to. I think Beatitudes is probably one of the most famous. What's the point of the Beatitudes? It's very poetic, it's very flowing, but what's the point of the Beatitudes? We're not going to read them all again, just in case you're wondering. Yeah, it certainly can be a primer for what he's going to be talking about. We talked about last week about how the Beatitudes kind of sets the stage. You need to have the right attitude before you move into the rest of it. If you don't have the Beatitudes attitudes, which sounds weird coming out of my mouth, but if you don't have the Beatitudes, the rest of it isn't going to be a part of your life. It's not going to make any sense. It's not going to seem really what you should be doing, so I think that's a part of it. What else is the point of the Beatitudes? Or is there any point? Maybe that was... Just Jesus' good morning part. Yeah. Trying to help them, help them divot from, um, it's still to get it years later, but the, the, he's, he's, he's beginning to, to let's see, help them pivot from focusing on a uh, earthly kingdom to a more spiritual, spiritual mindset. Yeah, I think that's probably, we talked two weeks ago about the idea of the kingdom mentality. I think kingdom is really big inside of the, or inside of the Sermon on the Mount, as is other themes like righteousness and prayer, that kind of thing. But you're right, I think when you look at the Beatitudes, and really this applies to the entire sermon, it's not about things that you do. And that seems really weird to say that these aren't things that you do. There are things that you are, and I think that's really the biggest difference. It seems like we're kind of splitting the hairs there. But he's saying that these are things that people are. This is who they, how they're defined as, and this is the attitude as they go throughout the life. So this isn't something that you kind of do. And as we talked about with verse 2, when it talks about this is the kingdom that he's talking about, he's talking to people who thought they were already in the kingdom or would just automatically be put into the kingdom. So the idea that this is something you have to be in order to be in that kingdom, which is spiritual nature, I think is pretty jarring. What else? Does anybody else have any thoughts on the Beatitudes before we get going? Yep. Yeah, I think you can certainly say it's the blessings that come from the proper attitudes. When you look at this, it says, blessed are these, blessed are these. The interesting thing about that, too, and we made this point last week, is that when you outline all the things that he says about the peacemakers and those who mourn, those who are hungry, they're not the types of people that would normally be blessed. So that's obviously countercultural, but it's also the audience that he's talking to. The audience that he's talking to are very hungry, they're very... Um, they're very sad about their condition. The spiritual elite are kind of dominating the scene. So I think that's obviously his argument. That's who he's talking to. If you look in verse 10 now, this is kind of the tail end of the Beatitudes as we move into our section for today. He says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecute the prophets who are before you. Why are these people persecuted? And this is kind of going to set the stage for what we talk about this morning, but why were these people persecuted? Because I think somebody made the comment last week, and I'd love to know who it was so I can give them credit. I think the flow goes towards if you are all these things, then you become this person that is persecuted. I'm going to give Jeff the credit because he usually deserves it, whether he knows it or not. But I know, you're humble now. You're mourning for righteousness, I get it. They're being persecuted because they're following what Christ says. Right. Right. 
better company. Yeah. But it's really tough for them to do that. It is tough for them, and that's, and once again, this whole idea of a spiritual covenant, spiritual kingdom, that's very odd for them. I think still people struggle with that idea when people think about this thousand-year reign of Christ. But I think it's interesting because he says, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Why would you be persecuted for the sake of righteousness? That almost seems odd. What is it about righteousness that evokes that reaction? Ken? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Jews, I mean, the Jews were the ones that were the primary drivers of persecution, especially in the first and early second century. So, I, I mean, you can make that argument that their own, their own family members were the ones kind of driving this. But if you zoom out a little bit, why is it that righteousness evokes this type of reaction? Jesus talks about this in John 3, about the relationship between darkness and light. But what is it that evokes that reaction? Right. Right. Yeah, they weren't fans of people like Amos. Amos is coming up and talking about all the things that they're doing wrong, and he says, "You need to get out of my sight." And he says, "Well, I'm just a shepherd. I'm a what's he say?" Yeah, Elijah is probably the biggest example. Elisha. I mean, all of the prophets. You're exactly right on that. And I think what you said there at the end is probably the main reason they have a tendency to call out the errors of that. I don't think he's necessarily talking to people who are really doing any kind of speaking, though. I could tell you, I could tell you, either you either struggled or you paused before you said the word jealous, and, I, and I'm not saying that to get onto you. I think that's, I think we have a hard time conceptualizing the why. Why is it that those who are those who are righteous are oftentimes persecuted by those who are unrighteous. I think jealousy can certainly play into that. Um, Lee, you had something. Or you had your hand up, at least. Not really, but it's the establishment that, that everybody believes in and follows. Uh, the righteous are going a different direction. They teach and believe something different than the establishment. And that, so they're butting heads. That's true, but I mean, it's not, it's not too uncommon to think about people, especially in that day and age, that were preaching something different that people just kind of went along with. I mean, you have, for instance, when Acts chapter 4, when you have the Pharisees kind of deciding what to do about, about uh, Peter and John, they talk about how Thutis rose up, Judas rose up, both these people claimed to be somebody. They didn't really interact with them. They kind of went, went off into the wilderness and, and disappeared. Yeah, but when they think what they're doing is right in the sight of God, and then they teach you, no, that's not what's right in the sight of God. Right. It does put a friction, but of course, that the understanding of that is is dependent on the idea that what you're doing is the right thing. So, and I know it sounds like we're splitting hairs here, but I think this is pivotal to understanding this because oftentimes when we talk about why people in the world hate people who are not of the world, we don't we just kind of accept it as fact. We don't really understand it, and that's kind of what I wanted to do for a couple of minutes here this morning, Nathan. Right. Yeah, and I, I think I, I think that's closer to it. And I think especially when you put it up with what we're going to talk about here in just a second, I think that gets a little closer to it. But I think it still is, once again, dependent on the idea that what Jesus and his people are doing is right to begin with. If they didn't know that, if they didn't feel that, understand that, they wouldn't care about it. A lot of people live lives differently than me that I don't care about. But if they're living better lives than me, I can have, a, I can have more of a visceral response to it. Yeah. There is something underlying there. Right. I'm, I'm here. I know I should be here, but I'm going to be here. Everyone's, it's kind of the status quo. Everybody's okay with the way the status quo is. When somebody comes in and challenges you to be better or to be different or to be deeper, or whatever the term you want to use is, I think that evokes a reaction because we don't like movement and anything. And I think that's a lot of it, too. Somebody else have any thoughts or comments on this before we move on? Paul? Right. Yeah, there, and that's what, and I really wanted to link the Beatitudes to what we're going to be talking about today. That's why we kind of opened up with that. But you're right. I think the Beatitudes are not something that you can checklist. You can't just checklist 
mourning for, you know, mourning for righteousness or mourning for the sin. You can't checklist that. It has to be a part of who you are. And I think, as you mentioned, there's a lot of people that will come in and just kind of, if you take it in a modern day complex, you just come in and kind of do the, do the rundown or the routine. But when somebody challenges you to be deeper, sometimes there's a, as we mentioned earlier, there's a visceral response to that because I don't want, I don't want that change. It's that inertia effect of it. So I think that there's a lot of things. And so when we talk about this idea of righteousness and the reaction that the Pharisees had, I, I think that's a question worth exploring. Why is it that the people of the world hate the righteousness of the righteous? That's a comment that we could probably spend an entire quarter just dis- discussing. He does link it, in my opinion, to what he says in verse 20. When he says in verse 20, I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is probably where people get mad. Why did they get mad at this point? Notice how it begins and ends with this kind of bookend statement. They weren't among the Christians, but among the Jews, they were probably seen in a lot of respects as being the epitome of it. If anybody's going to do, if anybody's going to go to heaven, it's going to be these people who have devoted their lives to it. So I think that there's probably a a fear issue? Well, I, there's no way my righteousness can exceed that of somebody who, as he would say later in the parable of the Pharisee and publican, somebody who fasts twice a week, gives tithes of everything they have. There's no way my righteousness can supersede that. So I think there may be a fear aspect of it. Ken? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, all their stuff is, yeah, it's surface only, it's for show, it's designed to bring praise to themselves. Yeah, and I mean, he doesn't come out and say it, but you're right, I think that's the insinuation that everyone has. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah, I think that was Jeff that said that. I'm going to give him credit for everything this morning in case you haven't noticed. But yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, there has to be a depth behind it. It's, and as you mentioned, especially with righteousness, you can make the argument that these people were righteous. And I have no problem with that because Matthew 23 talks about how these are people who sit in Moses' seat. So do what they tell you to do. There's an authority that's laden within their position. At the same time, when you look at what Paul says in Romans, he talks about these people who don't have a righteousness of their or of God's have created a righteousness of their own. So it is, by your definition, it's a righteousness according to law, but not the law of God. And I think that is what Jesus is really talking about. And this is really what I wanted to explore this morning. Jeff, go ahead. So, yeah, um, the righteousness for the Pharisees and scribes is, is very mechanical. Right. It's checklist, do this, do that, don't do that. Right. Or the righteousness that we're actually going to be persecuted in is the righteousness that Jesus taught. You know, the righteousness of the heart. Right. Do things for your heart. Exactly, and that's and that's one of the things that I think is fascinating about this. And well, like I mentioned earlier, we probably could have made the entire corner about this. But why is it that somebody who's diligently seeking to follow God is hated by people who supposedly are doing the same thing? And it's because, as we've already talked about, it's because the example of true righteousness shines the errors of the false righteousness, and it shows them that they're losing power. It shows them that their their religion wasn't real to begin with. And it really shakes you to the core of who you are. And people don't like that. I mean, nobody likes that. So I think you're right. It, there's a depth to it for sure. Nathan? We look over the next, the next few years after this, and mm-hmm. who's doing the persecuting? It's the scribes and the Pharisees that are doing the persecution. Of yeah. Them, you know, leading the persecution of the church. Yeah. You know, from a, like, like Jeff just said, those that are truly righteous are being That's true, and I agree with you. I mean, the Pharisees, especially when you get to the later half of Acts, the Romans have no clue why anybody, why, why these people are being charged with anything. Until you get to places like Acts 18, where Paul's teaching threatens the seat of Dionysus and, and Ephesus, and they, they, his teaching kind of disproves the idolatry that was there. And everybody kind of knew it, 
but nobody really thought to challenge it until Paul gets up. And so I think you see a similar reaction in kind of a different vein, a different vehicle. But you're right, I think, in a lot of respects. Curtis? Right. 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 Yeah. And today, even, the righteousness of God is the same as based upon faith, but the specifics have changed. When you look at yeah. Romans chapter 10, you're very well familiar with this, I know. That brethren of our hearts desire and our supplication of God is for them that they be set, may be saved by God. The Israelites have rejected Christ. Right. Okay. Uh, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God not according to knowledge. But being ignorant of, the God, of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves the righteousness of God. Okay, and mm -hmm. this, this, uh, this showing how Christ is the fulfillment of the law. Yeah. The of the law. Okay, so that that those who have rejected Christ were seeking righteousness of their own, so they wanted to be in control. Of right. And didn't submit themselves to the righteousness of God. They think the same thing about yeah. those Pharisees or whomever in that day that, that Jesus was speaking. The same exact thing is they was their their idea of righteousness was being challenged. Yeah, and that's and I think that's another theme, especially as we get into what we're going to talk about next week and probably through the middle part of this quarter, is about how what Jesus was advocating for was what they should have been doing all along. But they had branched a little bit differently, created this different version of righteousness, and everybody felt like it probably wasn't what they should have been doing. But if you're the loudest voice in the room, of course, that's probably going to attract the most followers. So I do agree with you about the nature of righteousness. When you look at chapter 5, starting in verse 13, he kind of makes some, he, he piggybacks off this idea of righteousness and its distinctive flavor by saying in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light then so shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. What is he? What two things does he compare Christians to? By the way, this is for the geeks out there. This is called the similitudes. In case you really wanted to know that, the attitudes was first in verses. Similitudes is now. But what does he compare Christians to in these verses? Salt and, salt and light. Why does he compare us to salt and light? This is both an easy question and really difficult at the same time. Why does he compare us to salt and light? Okay, salt and salt gives flavor to everything. I read a really convincing article a few weeks ago about how salt is used in manure and fertilization. I don't think that's what he's talking about here. I do think he's talking about the preservation quality of it, precisely because he says if it's if it loses its saltiness, you just throw it out. Then it's not good for anything. So I do think it's that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, the salt and light, the salt and light metaphors are interesting because I've heard, I've heard lots of arguments about how salt is used as obviously the distinctive flavor of it, but that its real property is in bringing out the flavor of whatever it's attached to. And so I think you can make that same comparison when you talk about something with light, because light doesn't do anything new to the surrounding environment except what? What does it do? It exposes what's already there. It reveals what's already there. And so if you think about that in terms of Christians. How are Christians both this kind of this distinctive bringing out of what should already be there and by the same token with light, exposing what's already in the immediate surroundings? How do Christians do that? Because we, we talk about the distinctive flavor of it, no pun intended, but... Mm-hmm. 
Exactly. In so many ways, what Christians do is reflect or shine or bring out or whatever you, or whatever you want to use to talk about it. It brings out the reality of truth, the truth of God's creation, the truth of the world around them. And that's why I think when you have this idea of the light and dark metaphor that Jesus talks about in John 3, I think it's so revealing because so many people prefer to stumble around in the darkness. We prefer, as Jesus talks about with, with the blind man, the blind leading the blind, both will fall into a ditch. I mean, there, we prefer in a lot of ways the darkness because why? We're branching into some weird philosophy tangents, but hopefully you'll stay with me. Yeah, if I don't know it, it's not there. Right, Romans 7. Covetousness? Covetousness, yeah. Yeah, and so if, if I remain numb to mm-hmm. the laws of God, I'm just, to put it one way, I'm fat and happy. Right? Yeah. I have, I have so little requirements of, me, of myself. Right. Yeah, if I, if I don't know about it, then maybe I'm not accountable to it. And, of course, Jesus, or Paul blows that out of the water, Romans 16. Everybody's without, witness, everybody's without excuse. But I think also when you, when you think about this idea of exposing these different things, you see what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 4 when he talks about a veil of the heart. That veil is taken away. Everybody, everybody asks for it. Or everybody sees the truth. But some people prefer to keep that veil over Moses' face. They, keep, they prefer to keep the veil over religion because it makes them, as you said, it makes them not accountable. It makes them not have to change their life. And that's, that's really what Jesus is challenging. And I think that's the answer to the question we asked earlier. Why does righteousness provide such a vitriolic reaction? It's because I'm challenging you. Jesus is challenging us to be better. And so this distinctive flavor of it is just a necessary byproduct of it. We're unique because we actually see the truth, because we actually see it for what it is. And I think when you compare it to what he talks about with the Beatitudes, you see a direct correlation here. When you talk about somebody who's poor in spirit, somebody who mourns because they see the state of the world, somebody who's gentle, somebody who's hungry for the truth, somebody who's merciful because that's what God's all about, all of these distinctive qualities create the salt and light. So in essence, this, if we can have this, is how you become this. But the only way in which you become salt and light is if you intentionally do the Beatitudes, if that makes any sense. Somebody have any thoughts or comments on any of that? Yeah, Lee? Some of the people are going to want to know the truth. Nicodemus wanted to. I mean, there was, in almost every conversation with Jesus and with the and with uh, the apostles in the Book of Acts, you have this kind of interesting epilogue on the end of all these conversations where it says that some people, you know, walked away and thought he was silly, but there were some that believed. And I think that's what you're looking at here. Is you see some people that are thinking to themselves, "Well, this doesn't make any sense." John six is a perfect example of that. Jesus talks about eating my flesh and drinking my blood. The vast majority of people are going to say he's crazy and walk away. But there's some people that are going to think to themselves, what is he really getting at? What does he mean by that? Can I explore more into that? And that's, I think, where this, this transition is coming from that Jesus is arguing for. Any other thoughts or comments? Yeah. But the reason we do that is because we know that it's the truth of what we need to understand to begin with. I mean, and that's, that's really the decision that all of us make at some point in our lives is are we going to continue chasing lies or are we going to follow the truth, make the decision to follow the truth no matter how painful it may be. So you're right. I mean, the reason we all come back to it is because of that, because we see the light, because we see the salt. Anybody else have any thoughts or comments on that? 
That's, I think, an interesting way to look at this. It's something that kind of opened up to me is, is we tend to think about how we are the salt and we are the light and that distinctive quality of it. But think about how it affects the world around us. I think that's really probably the purpose that Jesus talked about it. That being said, when you think about the distinctive qualities of something like salt and light, how do we become salt and light? And by the way, I don't have some vague, arbitrary 10-step thing up here. That's not what's up here. But if you think about the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, how do we become salt and light? How do we, have, how do we be distinctive? How do we show the truth? That kind of thing. It does take a lifetime commitment. Yeah, it's not, I mean, it's not something you should decide on Tuesday and abandon by Thursday. It's something you have to start and then add to throughout your life. Right. You have to be convinced of the truth. And I think that's one of the reasons why Paul talks about a dog can't return to its vomit. It's if somebody knows the truth and leaves it, there's not really anything you can do for them because there is no second truth. It's not like there's an alternate. How do we become salt and light in comparison or in context of the rest of the Sermon on the Mount? Go ahead. Yeah. So not drawing closer to... Yeah, not, not drawing closer to other things, drawing closer to God, seeking Him first before anything else. Yeah, I think that's a lot of it. Levi? Verses 15 and 16, I'm assuming, is the inspiration for the children's song, hide it under a bush of snow, come and let it shine. It's the whole Could you sing that for us, please, real quick? Maybe I'll do the hand motions. Okay. <laughs> um, you, don't, you can't, Jesus says, don't, if you're ashamed of me, I'm going to be ashamed of you. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you, yeah, if you've truly discovered the truth of something, then why would you, why would you hide it from other people? And so, you know, we talk about oftentimes with evangelism as being something we need to go do. I think in a lot of ways it's a byproduct of what we already believe about it. I hear this, I believe it. So of course I would share it, like we would share the good news about anything. So I do think that's right. You can't hide it under a bushel. No. That's the end of that song. Um, anybody else have any suggestions on that? I think when you look at the context of the Sermon on the Mount following this, I think there's a lot of argument to be made that this section in 10 through 20 is not the meat of it, but I think it provides a lot of the groundwork for what he's going to say. For instance, when he talks about immediately after this in verses 21 down through verse 48, he talks about the difference between who you are versus what you do. And how does he do this in those verses? It's a huge, long section. I think we're going to bite off most, if not all, next week. Yeah, you have heard that it was said. Right, you have heard that it was said, but I send you. What's the point of him saying this? He's not just saying, I'm going to give you the real truth on it. That's not really what it's about. It gets to the motivation about it. For instance, when he talks about you shall not, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit murder. That's a really high baseline. You can, everybody can follow that. But when he says to you, I tell you not even to hate your brother in your heart, what does that do to your faith? It challenges it. For, I mean, and we, we tend to think of it as that is existing in a silo. Okay, so if I don't murder somebody and I don't hate them, then that's just kind of this tube. But if you think about it elsewhere, how does not hating your brother in your heart filter out to everything else in your life? Which is exactly what we're talking about here. How does that filter out to everything else? If my, I just looked at John, and I'm not trying to pick on him, but if my bar for John is I'm not going to murder him, and vice versa, unless we think this is a one-sided affair, if we're just agree that we're not going to murder each other, okay, like that doesn't really affect a whole lot of things outside of the realm of a knife fight. But if I look at John and he looks at me and he says, I'm not even going to hate you, you're not going to hate me, then how else does that filter out to everything else that we are? I think it changes everything. Because then if he's in sin, well, okay, I made an agreement that I wouldn't murder him. But if I, if I say, well, I'm not going to hate you, then I see him in sin or vice versa, then I go to him. If he's not a Christian, I go to him. So I think it affects quite a bit of it. So it's the difference between who you are and what you do. The Pharisees were masters at what you do. What did they lack? They, they lacked being the actual person of God, at least by by most of them. You also see this immediately after this in service without praise. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 24, what's that talked about? With the exception of the prayer. I didn't want to just kind of
cut it off in the middle there. But with the exception of the prayer, what is those first 24 verses about? Showing service, sounding trumpets before you, but not really being somebody who's of a charitable heart. How does that, how does somebody who's salt and light give? How does somebody who's salt and light serve? Behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. They don't virtue signal. They don't call attention to all the things that they're standing up for necessarily. They don't have these grand displays of, of piety or anything like that. What they do is they are actually those things to begin with. And so I, I think when you're talking about the service without praise aspect, it's, it's, who you are, not who you want other people to think you are. I think that's a big part of it. And then when you look at the end of this, chapter 6 and 10 to chapter 7, you have this kind of resolve with our earthly life. Somebody mentioned earlier about the uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God. It was probably Jeff who said it. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, all these things, and it'll be added to you. But when you also look at, chap at the end of this, and he says in verse 25, I say to you, chapter 6, don't be worried about your life. This is what you'll eat, what you'll drink, nor for your body. It's not life more than food and the body more than clothing. This is the tail end of his sermon. And by this point in the sermon, what should you already be thinking? No matter what happens to me here, what? Be taken care of. When you look at chapter 7 and you see in verses 7 down through verse 12, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you'll find, knock and be opened to you. That's the comfort that comes from knowing that your priorities are elsewhere. They're not physical in nature. So I think all of this kind of goes into this idea of being salt and light. Paul? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And Paul alludes to that in First Timothy six when he says, "Having food and clothing, with these we shall be content." That's juxtaposed, which I think is your word, juxtaposed with the idea of that people who are greedy they think that godliness is some kind of means of great gain and they can attach themselves to it. And that's not really it at all. And I think part of the trick for that is it's not just to understand that. Know that I'll be taken care of. But to really kind of, in, in as much as sense as we can be, to kind of be okay with that. I mean, when Paul talks in Philippians chapter 4, I've learned how to be content, I've learned how to be in, in wealth, he doesn't say it as if he prefers one or the other. He just kind of says it as a state of being, whatever he is. And so I think there's lots of things that go along with that, being okay with whatever happens here. Because that's not really what I'm putting my emphasis on. It's what happens with God. That's what I really care about. Does anybody have any thoughts or comments on that? I thought I saw a couple of hands. All right. Right. But even that notion of be faithful unto death, we sometimes think of that as being obedient. That's part of what he's talking about, but really what it is is full of faith. Be full of faith until death. How do you do that? It's not just what you do, it's who you are. So I think that's the depth that he's describing here in this passage. Um, look back in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 17. He almost pivots, and this is one of the things that I thought was fascinating about this section, pivots almost. In verse 17 to say, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Why does he say this? What's that? Right. Right. The problem is not that the law was wrong. The problem was that the law had a, I don't want to say term limit, especially in a political year, but the law had an expiration date. It had a job to fulfill. And once that job was done, then it brought in the next law, which is the law of Christ. So he's not doing away with anything. As a matter of fact, in verses 18 and 19, he kind of reiterates this point. And when he says that heaven and earth, verse 18, is not going to pass away until the smallest stroke or letter comes from this. Verse 19, he kind of put, turns the spotlight on himself by saying, if this is something that I do, then even I'm going to be held guilty of that. So that's not what he's saying in verse 17. He's not saying, well, the law of Moses is just flawed. That's not what he's saying here. You were, I think, did you jump? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's sometimes the insinuation that we have about the old law was that it was just it was flawed in some way, that it wasn't it wasn't perfect. The old law was a lot of things. 
But imperfect it wasn't. It served its purpose, as you mentioned about. And even Paul would admit, I think in, I, I can't remember exactly what he talks about, but he kind of alludes to the idea that even if, if I can't even follow it, then nobody could follow it. I mean, it's just impossible to follow a Pharisee of Pharisees, that kind of thing. So it's built in to be impossible. But even in that, Hebrews makes it plain that it can't really provide this eternal forgiveness. And so that's, that's not really anybody's argument. Nobody's arguing for that. But why does he say this in verse 17, especially in context of what he is talking about? Yes, Ken? Right. And you're right. I mean, go ahead. It's a change from what they had been, what they were taught, and had been taught. But is it really a change? Because I think, I think part of the struggle with these verses is to see them. It's not just enough that I don't kill Cody, but I don't know. Yes. Vice versa, you have to have it both ways, sir. Yeah, I know. Save your skin. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a depth to it. I do agree with that. I think that when you look at the when you look at the context, it's so it's so interesting because verses 13 down through 16 is talking about letting men see your good works that they glorify God, but then he says in verse 17, "I didn't come to abolish the law; I came to fulfill." And then you're right. After that, verse 21, he talks about you have heard that it was said, but I say to you, keep going. Okay, so take that point that you just said, and that's really what he's getting at here. Is the accusation that was leveled against both Jesus and the apostles was what? That they did away with the old law. That they did away with the old law. Acts twenty, Acts chapter twenty. There's a specific reference about Peter, about Paul, that he's come here to destroy Moses and to defame the old law. Is that what any of these people were doing? No. What were they doing? They were talking about the fulfillment. Now, to the average person, does the average person see that? To the average Jew that's listening to this sermon from Paul, does he really make that connection? Maybe, 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 maybe. Yeah, because of, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Paul, Jesus said in Mark four that yeah, he's not doing that. So he's not making that connection. You're exactly right, Paul. Right. Exactly. And that's the hard part, I think, when you're especially looking at the Pharisees, is two things. Number one, the average person, probably self-included, because I'm putting myself in this audience that would probably listen to this, I don't know if I would make the delineation between fulfillment and termination. They seem like they have the same end results. So I don't know if I would make that thing. At the second point is, if the Pharisees accept that the old law has been fulfilled, what does that mean for their career path and their 401k? They're gone. They're cooked, front to back. So if you if you think about this from a hostile perspective, Jesus isn't just saying Jesus isn't just saying that this is the fulfillment of one and move seamless into the other. There's a whole lot of people that have a lot to stake in these verses. And so I think verses 17 through 20, as clear as I can see it, is a transition point. When he says in verses 13 through 16, "Let your light be seen with the become the salt of the earth," that's what these people already should have been. And then when you continue that point into verse 21, you have heard that it was said, but I say unto you, he's stating what the law really was meant to be, as Curtis talked about all along. They didn't get that because they had contaminated it. And so they then accused Paul and the apostles and Jesus of ending the law. He didn't end the law. He just corrected it to where it should have been. Anybody have any comments on that? Mm-hmm. Right. So they should have known They are, and I, and I don't want to describe only blame. It's real, it's real awesome to just kind of nail the Pharisees down and everything. But at the same time, 
if you're an average Jew in this time period, especially under the yoke of not just one, but two, maybe even three empires in the span of 400 years, you're looking for some kind of physical satisfaction. You want a physical kingdom because it resolves your physical problems. The challenge is not just to convince people of a spiritual kingdom, but of the need for a spiritual kingdom. So the Pharisees played right into their hands by saying, okay, this kingdom that's coming, it's not spiritual, it's actually physical and all these different things. So I think they worked hand in hand in that. But what Jesus is getting at with all this is the real intent of the law. Did God ever mean when he said, thou shalt not murder, did he ever mean that that was where it should stop? No. no. Why do you know that? I think they probably knew it too, but why do they know that? Or how do you know that? Exactly. Right. God hammered them in the prophets about how they treated foreigners, by how they treated orphans, by how they treated each other. Obadiah is all about that. Obadiah is all about how the Edomites mistreated their Israelite brothers. I mean, it's all about that. So it never was meant to stop there, but that's where they had stopped, and that's the righteousness that they created for themselves. And I think that delineation between what God's law is and what their law is, I think that's really key to understanding this dynamic. Here's a question for us to think about. I wrote it down because if I say it, it's probably going to be confusing because I talk too fast. But when Jesus says that he's fulfilling the law, that's his goal, that he says he's fulfilling the law, and they say that he's changing it or ending it, what does that tell you about the Pharisees' interpretation of the law? Incomplete at best. Yeah? They were just what we call legalists. They were just aware of the structure of the sentence, and so they were able to quote that, but what it meant, they didn't Right. The reason that these people have said in 21 through 40, or that they've heard, this is it, this is it, you have heard that it was said, you have heard, is because that's where the law stopped for those people. And so if Jesus continues on, they're going to accuse him of saying, well, that's a completely different law. That's not a completely different law. That's just their interpretation of the law. I think that's a big part of it. Anybody else have any answers on that one? If Jesus says that he's fulfilling the law and they say he's changing it, what does that tell you about the Pharisees' interpretation of it? They were called hypocrites, but I think it also shows that they had their own interpretation of the law at the base level that was separate from what God meant. And I think that is what he's talking about immediately after that. Right. The final right. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be the restoration of the Jewish state. It's going to be the, the eternal kingdom of the Jews, and the Messiah is going to sit at the throne of that. So the idea that this Jesus is coming in with something different is, in their minds, totally separate from what they're talking about. What's amazing is the world still struggles with this today. They struggle with it all the time. <laughs> the idea that there's something spiritual instead of something physical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not taking the prophets into account. Right. You know, when, you have, when you have statements like you know, Jeremiah 31 31, mm -hmm. plainly says what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's just like they're, they're looking at one side but not the other. Yeah, they're, not, they're, they're only looking at what they want to look at and they're ignoring everything else. And that is the incomplete aspect of it. Yeah. I'm going to use my math example here. You know, Be careful, you've got a math teacher sitting next to you. you know, so. The divide and multiply, you have to first learn to. Right. right. So the Pharisees never really got a past and subtract. Yeah. They couldn't understand building upon that with Christ building upon yeah. the law to make it more perfect. Yeah, and I and I think and you're exactly right, and while you were talking about that, about learning the foundational aspects before you move into something else, I think in a lot of ways this is exactly what we deal with in today's world. If you if you look at the religion or the Christianity that a lot of the world is peddling in today's world, it is very surface only. It is very bare minimum, do whatever you need to do. And so any challenge to go deeper, to be deeper, to be something more, to actually be a Christian, immediately emits charges of works-only salvation or anything else that you can think of, when in reality all we're doing is challenging them to go deeper in the faith that they already profess to believe. Yeah, I agree with that totally, because we're challenging them not to just feel good, but right. actually do good. Right, not just... Do the works that yeah. is outlined in the Don't just be overjoyed by the sound, be actually invested in what the truth of the gospel is. Yeah. If you look again at verse 19, as we're kind of pushing towards the end of this, in verse 19, he says, Whoever then annuls the least of these commandments will be called, um, will be called uh, least in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever keeps and teaches them, he will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. What does Jesus mean when he says this? There's three verses here at the end of this section. This is number two that kind of stand out. No, I don't know the answer, because what confuses me is he says, if you don't do it, you're going to be the least in the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't say you're not going to be in the kingdom of heaven. That is always confusing. So over to you. <laughs> 
Wow, that was un that was unnecessarily aggressive, but yeah. You know, I mean, it is, it's very confusing. There are other passages that talk about how even the least in the kingdom of heaven is still in the kingdom. I mean, so, especially when you talk about how he, Jesus talks about kids. Yeah. Yeah, it is confusing, and I don't have an exact answer to that, so I'll do what I did to Levi last week, which is say that I'll study it, forget, and bring it up a year from now. So both of you guys owe y'all an explanation. But I do think that does create some issues with this. Is People say, well, if, if I'm the least of the kingdom, then at least I'm in the kingdom, so what does it matter? It's not like there's a kingdom and then a kingdom plus that I really want to be a part of. I think that's a part of the confusion around it. Yeah. Yeah, keep the law, but actually, actually keep the law. Don't just keep what you want to keep. It's about keeping it. And I think this is a direct shot towards what he's talking about with the with the Pharisees who are going on and telling people, well, you don't have to do this, you have to do this. You know, a perfect example of this elsewhere, when Jesus says anybody that would give to their parents, you can circumvent that by doing what? You don't have to take care of your parents. What can you do instead? You can dedicate to you can dedicate it to the temple instead. Yeah. I already wrote a fat check to the synagogue, and so because of that, I can't take care of your hospital bills, Mom. I'm, I just I apologize for that. They're essentially in that passage doing exactly what Jesus is talking about here, which is teaching them to circumvent the law. And I think this also plays into what he talks about immediately after this, is where I thought the conversation was going, but Paul brought up a great question. If you look in verses 21 through 48, by saying don't murder, okay, that's one thing. But you're still not really fulfilling the law by not murdering. You're fulfilling the law by not, by not hating your brother. So I think there's another element to that as well. Look at what he says in verse 20. We have about two minutes left. He says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. What type of righteousness is it that the Pharisees have? We've talked about this and hit around it so far this class. What kind of righteousness do the Pharisees have? To righteousness of their own, of their own making, which is impossible. If I'm trying to live by anybody else's standards, religious or not, it's going to be impossible for me to fulfill that because the rules are always going to be changing. So I, I think that's a part of it. Superficial. Superficial? Yeah, there's no way I can give X number of dollars more than the Pharisees gave. They gave $20,000. I don't have that laying around, certainly not on a regular basis. So I can't have that same superficial righteousness. Paul? Yeah, they appear to be holy and righteous when in reality they're not. So you're talking about a righteousness that's not just superficial. It's very burdensome. It's, it's all about do this and don't do that. Yeah. It's not about thinking and, yeah. and acting. Right. You could overlay this with Matthew 23, which is just eight, the eight woes of Jesus towards the Pharisees, one of which goes perfectly in what you said, which is they tie up heavy loads and bind them on people, but they themselves are not even willing to lift a finger. So there's this labor-intensive, superficial, moving goalpost type of idea it, it of righteousness. You know, it's not developing that lower person into the being a better yeah. towards God. All you're doing is... It's just, like you said, putting a burden on them to keep your tongue. Right. All you're doing is creating cult disciples at that point. People that follow you, they're not interested in, they don't actually follow God, which is, in my opinion, just sinful to the nth degree. Does anybody have any thoughts or comments about any of these verses? Yeah. 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 And I think this is kind of to your point. I think this is, I mean, all of the sum of the matter is relevant. Don't get me wrong. But I think all this is really relevant for us on an everyday basis. When you think about the bad attitudes, you think about what we're talking about here, we have to kind of constantly examine our own life. Am I really mourning? Am I really. Does my righteousness really extend past this superficial idea? Or am I just kind of living in a way that I'm hoping everybody will think I'm going to heaven, 
when I really don't have any interest in God whatsoever? These are questions that I think we can ask ourselves on a very regular basis. Levi? You had more material to try to get through? Nope, that's it. Okay, so going back to the, um, uh, how, can, how can Jesus teach, teach the way he does and then, um, and then say that I didn't come to abolish the block and fill it? Yeah. And that brings up a really great point. I mean, that it, that there's a, the, the idea that you're doing something that's not visible, that the most important thing is maybe what's unseen. Because if you think about the Pharisees, they excelled in these areas of the, the visible religion, the sacrifices, the giving of money, that type of stuff. But the idea of, of what he's talking about there is that there's something deeper than that that nobody can see, but that's where the real truth is. I think you're right. I think Jesus was obviously very impressed with them. But it goes back to what the Old Testament was all about. I don't desire sacrifices. I desire obedience. That's what I really want. I don't desire... Um, I can't remember what the first thing is, but I require mercy. That's what I'm after. So, yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting. And I like how Jesus ends that, as you mentioned. You're not far from the kingdom of God. You're on the right track. Just keep going down that path. Yeah. All right. Anybody else have any thoughts or comments? The children are approaching, so we'll end there for right now. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>